we have a quorum. Okay, well then, good evening. Welcome to Hold the- Hold on, one second, Will. Just give me one moment so I can- Yep, just... start over. Yeah. <laughs> Take two. Thank you. I'll let you know. Take two. We're Thank good. You. I'll let you know. Yeah, I heard that. All right, so welcome everyone to the June Executive Committee meeting for Manhattan Community Board 4. Because of summer schedule, um, committee work that was done at June committee meetings would not be able to get to full board until the end of July. And given the times we live in, some of these items are of a time sensitive nature. So we've got a bunch of letters that will be voted out of exec tonight to be ratified by the full board at the end of July. Um, it's the quirk of how we run our summer schedule. So the first two letters are from the Housing, Health and Human Services Committee. Joe and Maria. Joe, I guess the 49th Street one is definitely you, right? Yes. All right, why don't you take that away and explain what's going on? Can you have Maria start the other one first? I need to get up on my screen. I haven't gotten a check. Maria, you with us? I am. I am. Are you here. ready to discuss the letter to the mayor and DHS about temporary hotel shelters? Yes, I can um, share the letter. Um, All right, so let's start with that one, yeah. So basically the letter is regarding the temporary relocation of several congregate setting shelters into our community, particularly in Hell's Kitchen, um, that total the number of 2,100 beds. Um, so the letter basically, I would say, I, I hope you all got to read it, it's a little bit long, but the, it highlights the concentration of shelters in our neighborhood. It highlights the lack of notice that we received regarding all the, um, the residents coming into the hotel shelters. And it also highlights the issue of the lack of guidelines DHS provided for the operators or the nonprofit providers, particularly around safety. Um, it also highlights, let's see what else. We also highlight in the letter the, the blocks that seem to have the most issues, which are 36th and 37th Street, as well as 51st Street. And on 36 and 37, we just need to change the number in the letter. Um, it says 518, but it actually should be 812 um, beds that are on that block. Um, and we might have to change another number on 51st Street. But um, we, we discussed that. Uh, I just want to give you the highlights. Give me one more second. The letter also highlights the consideration for the shelter residents' needs. Um, because it would really be best if they were closer to their own communities. Um, for example, the BBSJ on 50, West 57th Street came from Brooklyn, I think, or Far Rock. I think it was Far Rockaway. I can't remember right now. Joe would remember. But Far Rockaway. Um, for, far Rockaway. So keeping those residents closer to their community, their resources, their services. Um, and basically, uh, that is it and one of the things that, we yeah one of the one things th the, the other thing i just want to mention that i think is important is also even the relocation of the family shelter that we had at the skyline hotel teachers and principals in the community were not even aware of that that families had relocated and i think that's really important and significant that um dhs didn't coordinate this better and just that the lack of input that we as a community board had as well as elected officials in determining our own community and where we know the issues are. And we could have given alternative suggestions. Joe, you were gonna say something. Uh, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing we learned in the discussion we had with uh, regarding another homeless project on West 41st Street is that DHS pretty much had no plan in place. They proceeded and now they're not even quite sure how to respond. I mean, that's what I left that meeting with. The last thing we made clear in this letter is that they are turning our community away from both right. any kind of homeless shelter or supported housing. 
because it's just coming at us so fast and furious. The feel in the, the meetings we've had, our meeting last month was 73 people. This month was about 37 people and people really upset about these things and the way they're being managed. The street conditions have deteriorated dramatically. Jesse, you haven't been able to go by there yet, have you? No, I have not. All right. So I, I encourage everybody to walk by either on 37th or 36th Street or 51st, and you will see the remarkable change. Very, very disturbing. Hello? Christine, go ahead. Yes. So I agree. I've walked on 37th Street. I live on 38th, so I, I walked on 37, and the back of my building is on 37. Uh, first, you cannot walk on the sidewalks. There are concentration of people with no mask and, um, you know, a large group of people. So you have to change side or walk in the streets. And the second thing is at night, there are, you know, mini parties going on in the streets. So you, uh, it's pretty noisy and it's very, very uh, bad. As the uh, second phase of opening is, where there are going to be more residents and more people walking in the streets, it seems to me that we need to ask uh, in our letter, when are they going to go back to where they come from? We are not asking an action for them to be relocated where they were. Is it at the beginning of, of phase three? Is it phase four? I mean, you know, are we going to get stuck with that forever? What's, what's the deal? I think we should articulate that more. We raised that in our Friday call yeah. and the assistant commissioner was not able to say when. I said, so let's assume for a moment, the worst case, this may be through the summer of next year. This has to be managed. Certain shelters have to be relocated. The concentration is way too big. So I think we can amplify that in a letter. Would that be helpful, Christine? Yeah, I think, I think that should be kind of the main ask. I mean, you know, the past is the past. They tell you, they will tell you it's, 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 it was COVID and we couldn't do anything and blah, blah, blah. But now we are in, a, in an orchestrated process to reopen the city. And it, they should have deadlines for when they are going to relocate these people. Well, our main ask is in the interim, because it could go on for a long time, that we right. don't have the concentration on every block. That's the crazy part. But you can't have 518 people on every block. But I don't think we should accept that we have that concentration or-, or no, I'm saying no, we should not. That, that's the point. Right. right. So, I mean, I think we should definitely ask for a schedule of, of uh, migration back to uh, where people were. Because yeah, you, know, you know what's going to happen. The hotels are not going to have business. They're going to be only too happy to keep, to keep that business. And we don't, want, we don't want that to become a little economical, you know, incentive for people to stay around. Yes, I believe, Christine, that was um, something in the letter. It may not, uh, I think we may not have to highlight prominent. that. Right, but right. I would make it we may have to. I mean, you know, I would like to have deadlines and say on, on, on such and such a date or phase three, 50% uh, go away, you know, something like that. Right. Okay. I think it's more, they should give us a schedule of how yeah, this proceeds. Yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, in that kind of framework. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Joe, I, I, today is a little rough, so I, I did not get a chance to really thoroughly, Maria, I apologize as well, go, go through the letter, but I think the point we were making with um, DHS last week, which is that, you know, we have a process for this, right? We have a, we welcome, we welcome the provider in, we have, we create a, a community advisory committee, you know, we meet monthly, we get the community around it involved. This is, there's no ability to do that process. So I think we would need, normally we'd put it on our, our shoulders, but we can't be running, you know, 10 community advisory committees for each of these shelters. Right. You know, I think it has to be coming from the administrative, you know, the side, either the providers are told that they have to do it or, or the or the DHS runs sort of runs some type of you know routine check-in because if, if you like you said if they're going to be there for months to a year then you know so we'll we'll highlight the discussion we had on Friday saying some sort of like master community advisory committee so we can manage right. this and it's mandated as opposed to the board taking the lead 
kind of stuff. It's just too much. I mean, right? I mean, you guys have normal jobs. <laughs> you just can't be meeting every night for a different community advisory committee for all these shelters. There, there, were, there were two discussions about this on Friday alone. So, you know. Anyone have any further questions on this one? Any further questions on this? J JD. Uh, yeah, excellent letter, uh, Maria and Joe. Um, just in the letter, um, is there any mention that the Speaker of the City Council, our council member, uh, apparently is not notified about uh, by DHS about these shelters, uh, the, uh, what, uh, what's happening? Is there any emphasis in the letter that our council member needs to be notified so he can notify the community? We did note that, but I think we can highlight it more. Thank you. Okay. Be Betty? Betty, you're on mute. <laughs> it's now an official Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay. Uh, from Christine walking on 37th Street, it got me an idea that um, maybe this is too unorthodox <laughs> to take the photos of, of what's going on. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So Christine doesn't like that idea. But anyway. I've actually requested someone to do that, Betty. Already. You, you have already. Oh, good. Because I, I just think it makes a big difference to the quality and for people who read. It has to be done letter. carefully because people will you actually don't get want to, if they do it. Uh, yes. <laughs> you don't want their faces in the picture and all that kind of thing. Well, um, no, that isn't a problem. These are people that are on the street. But it's just that how you do it so it's not so obvious. And right, right, right. right. The, other, the other thing about the criteria. I like that idea. Good. The, the other. I'm all I'm all worked up about this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, good. Um, the other thought I had is maybe since the governor has phase one, phase two, phase three, and Christine had some good ideas. Like maybe we could t try to persuade DHS to to have some criteria, like when you get to stage three. You know, 50% go out of your neighborhood or I, I don't know what. I, I'm just trying to think. get a new agency, get a new mayor. They're not <laughs> thinking like this. Anyway, that's that's what I'm what I'm thinking. You know, if we had some benchmarks if we had, that, that could could change the shelter hotel population, because also we didn't make it in the letter, but we want to encourage the hotels to come back to their original use, you know, right. good for the economy. You know, we but might... I, I think we need to focus with DHS on this because no. no, it's sort I of, know. It'll, it'll make it a little more amorphous. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, that's my two cents. Anyone else have any comments on this letter? All right, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, move to adopt. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Right. Any any opposed say nay. Any abstentions or present not eligible. Kit, okay. were you abstaining? Kit abstains. Letter passes. All right, next just, letter. Just well, just a point of clarity, just just so, so folks that we have we have enough, we have about four folks in uh in the public section. So just because we didn't give this sort of a preamble at the beginning of the committee that we normally do that for them to uh, want to speak on a specific letter, they should raise their hand. It's a, it's a virtual hand. It's a little blue hand on the, under the participant section. So if you need to do that, you can do that. You can always, always unmute yourself and, uh, or try to unmute yourself, but uh, that's the best way to, or you can put it in chat, but virtually raising your hand. Yeah, I saw nothing in chat. I saw nothing in Q and A and I saw no hands raised, so. I'm just, for their edification. Yep, understood. Okay, Joe, next letter, 49th yes. Street. The next letter, I had, it was a very, it's a very complicated matter that came to us in the middle of COVID. It has been postponed. We had a series of discussions regarding a tax exemption for a series of 14 buildings on West 49th Street. We spent a lot of time at the committee on this and I committed to Lowell, we would at least have a series of bullets for tonight. 
we're better than bullets, but we're not to a full letter yet because of the complexity of this. So if you look through it, we have our 14 tenements that were acquired for over $110 million about four, three, four years ago. The owners, after making that investment, with the change in the rent laws, can no longer possibly make those kind of mortgage payments. They went to the city of New York for tax relief. And the city responded, we will give you tax relief if and only if you commit toward a 40 year affordability for a good number of units there. So what normally happens here, this would come to us, they started this process more than a year ago, a year and a half ago. We were told about the process about in April of this year or in late March, and they didn't know why they had to come to us at all. And in fact, HPD told them they didn't need to come to the community board. This just would be approved as a matter of course with council. So we've been in a back and forth with this group and it took a long time to understand what exactly was the proposal. We have that information now. And the owner will receive approximately $30 million in a tax exemption over the 40 year period in exchange for keeping 196 units in these 14 buildings as affordable. And it's a very complex regimen. If you go to the second page of the letter, you'll see there's a chart that gives you the units at the different income bands that are affordable. Very quickly, so, Jim, just because I know I just got, you just got it to me and I just got it out. I can share the letter on my screen to people if that makes it better and easier for folks. Sure. Okay. All right, give me a second. Yes, I'll, please. I'll keep on talking and I'll find it. Yeah. And, and by the way, I know we're navigating a complex pile of stuff here, but it's the best we could do considering it was Thursday night that this meeting happened. So are you ready, Jesse? Uh, give me one second. So this building has 54 units out of the 272 that are market rate. Those of those, 29 of them will return to rent stabilization at all nope, these incomes. Not working yet. No, yeah, sorry. No. Give me one. Keep on talking and I'll find it. Okay. Um, there will also be a homeless set aside here of a certain percentage. We have asked the question as to which income bands that homeless set aside is. We haven't gotten a response yet. The owners are doing something voluntarily in this part of this deal. They are doing COVID-19 rent forgiveness for approximately two months or three months in order to make this work a little bit better for long term to the tenants who are there. And as part of any work that article that uh, tax exemption is granted for, the owners must do certain capital work in the building, mostly around if energy efficiency and uh, water waste. What they had to do was do a, a capital needs assessment and these were the items that came out of that capital needs assessment that HPD is requiring them to do. A sub program in this is called aging in place, although we learned it doesn't matter how you're aging as long as you're in place. The, that program means that if you are requesting any sort of ADA things like grab bars, things being modified, cabinets being moved, you can request and at no expense to you, you will have those. Jesse, that's page three. You will have, you will have that work done by the owner at no expense to you. The issues we found as also these units will be marketed. So there's a lot of question about the marketing. The New York City Housing Partnership will actually do the marketing, but it's unclear when and how it happens. And then specifically, the city of New York said there could be no community preference requirement here. We've never seen this before. So that's one of our conditions of approval here. There must be a community uh, preference requirement. The, so therefore, our conditions are the lottery must have community preference. A very odd thing, the actual unit designation of which unit is of which income band, the city does not record against the property. How we would ever be able to enforce or respond to questions about this is crazy. They do it as a side letter. So, we, so our other, other condition is, is that we must have the list of the units of various income bands recorded. And then the renovation, they, the owners have agreed to whenever a unit turns over, they will renovate it up to the standard they've been renovating vacant units before. 
However, there is no enforcement mechanism in the documents. The owner said they're willing to do that. The last is Airbnb enforcement. And until this last couple of weeks when the city and Airbnb came to an agreement, it really was not possible to do enforcement. Now they can, and they agreed that they would do enforcement. So these are the broad brushes of this. There's a lot more detail uh, to be put in, but I will take any questions on this rather complex project. Any questions? Take it please, up use the raise, please use the raise hand because with the, the letter up there, I can't see everyone. Jeffrey. Joe, is this a common estimate in terms of their ask, in terms of the, what they're getting for this tax abatement? Are we, I mean, what happens when they still go belly up in this article? Oh, yeah. So, so, so it, it took a while, Jeffrey, a probing committee to understand this. That's the maximum benefit they could get, roughly the 30 million. However, and I have to get this very clear from them, they don't get a benefit unless the units are occupied with income eligible tenants. So that benefit grows over time. Their response was they've had a 30 to 40% turnover in their units on a regular basis. They claimed that a lot of the rent stabilized rents were close to market. Not, not, not that clear, but they gave us a full rent roll. So they will only get benefit for the units occupied with income eligible tenants. Our, the committee's concern immediately was you can't, get, you can't give them a benefit if the units are not occupied by eligible tenants, even though they may be rent stabilized, and they clarified that. And then just, is this a, I don't know this, this landlord, is this a Hell's Kitchen buyer? I mean, are we familiar with this? No, they, this is, this is, a, a, this is a, a citywide, a citywide real estate trust type people. These are people who bought lots of buildings yeah. to make a lot of money and got caught. We've yeah. also asked that HCC be part of this discussion because the offer for the tenants quote aging in place repairs was done in March in the very beginning of COVID. So that's crazy. So HCC said they would help and work with the tenants. And furthermore, just to have the tenants have some sort of representation in this, to understand what's going on here. The last thing we wanna see are people being asked to move in order for a affordable unit to be created for a tax exemption to be created, so. All right, Dale, you're next. Um, Joe, thanks for trying to put some accountability around this. Um, <laughs> um, is the, I see that, I saw the section when the document was up that said like COVID related um, changes. Is what you outlined verbally, what would go in there? Like there was some rent, there was some rent, rent forgiveness? Yeah. Could one just, of the, yeah. yeah. Just one of the things. One more time. Yeah. yeah. The owners will do a certain amount of rent forgiveness across the board. And uh -huh. they gave it to us in a PowerPoint that I now got to translate into language to put into the letter. Okay. The PowerPoint, Del Dolores made a comment during the meeting. They didn't sell themselves that well. Like it took us to pull information from them to get to where we were going. Right. So there's like a period of time in which the rent is forgiven across the board. I, I think people have to apply for it, but I will get the details about that. Okay. Thank you. And, and also part of it is, Dale, I want to make sure to redraft this, we get this to the owner to make sure that everything is, you know, ties in properly. Right. I gotcha. Thanks. All right. Who is up next? Uh, Bert. Yeah. Uh, Joe, in terms of the units, I assume there's um, studios, one bedrooms, two, three bedrooms. Studios, okay. ones and twos, mostly, mostly studios and ones. These are okay. tenements that were renovated in the 1930s. They all have full bathrooms, but they were all, these, are, these used to be tubs in the kitchen and, 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 and a doctor purchased them. And they were the source of a lot of HCC complaints in the 1980s. These are the Dr. Larrick buildings. Okay. This, my, so, my question though is, is it an even distribution in terms of um, the, uh, the income bands in other words are there one no. bedrooms in all the income band bands oh yeah 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 the, the, there are the majority of units here are studios and ones overwhelmingly like about 80 percent are studios and ones if not more and they're relatively evenly distributed yes. across yes. the band that's what i wanted to know thanks jd uh yeah good work joe maria uh, the homeless component joe do we know what percentage and do we know is it for is there a preference for families 
I believe it's either 10 or 15. And the real question we have, JD, is in what rank does it come? So frequently in the city, there could be a unit at a higher AMI band, and the city could say, we're gonna do homeless first, and we'll give subsidy. So we simply don't know. That's one of the questions we have out to this owner to be more specific about. Thanks, Joe. Christine? Yes, Joe, you made a point that you didn't want the, uh, uh, you know, existing tenant to be moved out uh, it, for renovations, et cetera. Is, there, is that something we could put in our conditions pretty clearly? I think we have to say that carefully, but I, I, I get the point. Got it. Right. Okay. Betty? Uh, I think we might have talked about this in the committee, but I forgot. Uh, we raised the issue of whether the rent stabilized units are permanently affordable or do they expire at a certain time, like 40 years? The, do you the, remember the, that? The regulatory agreement runs with the 40 year tax exemption. However, the rent stabilization is the rent stabilization. So when they put the 29 units back, from market into rent stabilization, that stays in place as long as rent stabilization stays in place. Uh, I think it would be good to put that in the letter. But this again is an only is, is a forty year affordability run. Right, but it's good that we know that. Th th that's in the letter. I think it's the rent stabilization. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think you're right. It's at the top of page two. Didn't see it. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Not seeing any questions from the attendees. Not seeing any more questions from the panelists. Move to adopt. I have a motion. Do, is there a second? Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say no. Any abstentions or present not eligible? That passes unanimously. Next up, Christine and Dale. We have two letters from transportation. Let's do the traffic enforcement responsibilities first. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, this is a letter where um, you know that there are a lot of discussion about defunding the NYPD. And um, we are not recommending that. What we are recommending is that they separate the Transportation Bureau from the NYPD and put it back with DOT the way it was in 1996. And, um, and you know, that would allow uh, the NYPD to be a little smaller and then the NYPD has not, never been really very uh, uh, excited or focused on the Bureau. And I think putting it with the DOT could generate a lot of synergies and a much better management of some of the function as we described in the letter. So that's what we are recommending. We're suggesting we should send this letter because apparently those discussions are taking place right now with the, uh, with the council, with their uh, funding. And uh, to me, that would be a much better option than uh, defunding. I mean, you know, defunding could be an option, but I'm not competent to say that. On, on the Transportation Bureau, I think that would be a very good option to break it away. Okay, Bert. Questions? Yeah, the, the per You're on mute, sir. The, per the personnel who are involved in this, are they police officers? It's a mix of things. When uh, a lot of them, as you can see, uh, for the agents, there are about 3,000 of them, which are civilian, for sure. Right. And then you have what I describe here. I don't know what I described here, but the, the, the collision. The, 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 the management, traffic management center and traffic operation district. I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of civilian functions there because this is an engineering kind of, of function, but I don't know for, for a fact. And then when you get to the highway division, you have a lot of uh, officers there. And, um, and, and they are the people who really give the moving violation and we do the investigations of the uh, crashes. So are you proposing, let me see if I can get that clear. Are you provo pro proposing the civilianization of those currently, those positions currently filled by police officers 
or are you proposing to move actually police offices into DOT? I'm proposing to move the whole function in DOT and let DOT figure what they need to do with it. Because I, I, I don't you, quite understand that. But what I'm saying is that you, if you move the whole transportation function to DOT, you know, I'm not making the decision of who is doing what inside DOT. If they feel that everything can be done. I understand, I understand civilianization of police currently, positions currently filled by police officers. Right. That I understand. This I'm not really clear on. What I'm saying is that there are two populations, one which is civilian, moving all of that to DOT is, is, is like a no brainer, right? Then there is a subset which is uh, officers and I think they are going to have to think about whether they need those officers to be to remain officers or to be civilian. And and I, I, we are not making a recommendation on that part of it. All right, um, Alan, next. I thank you. All the officers that get moved over stay with NYPD, and, and their their roles are filled by civilians. But my my question is. Um, was there a goal back in 90 something or other? Was there a reason why this was taken out of DOT? Did they have certain aspirations to make the system better somehow? And you know, what, why was it any, any clue as to that? Just curious. I, I don't, I don't. Okay. I, I do. All right, Bert, can you answer that question? Um, the question at that time, the mayor was Rudy Giuliani. And the idea was to take not only those positions, from DOT, but for example, school safety people, which were at the Board of Education in those days, they moved all of those people into NYPD. The idea was somehow having them all in a blue uniform under one authority would, would, it, would create a better, more effective, more forceful population or a larger NYPD a more powerful NYPD in terms of body count well you're, you're looking at, at, at need for resources. a bureaucratic yeah. way yeah 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 make it like too big all right thank you Alan Betty a um, couple of things um, just from stylistic point of view um, the second paragraph gets a little dense you might use bullets for that like each division or whatever it is, what they do. Okay. And I was wondering on page two, uh, the second paragraph, we talked about this book and uh, the second sentence says, vehicle stops are generally not criminal encounters, etc." Would it be correct to say that according to this book, vehicle stops are generally not criminal yeah. encounters? Yes. I, I think I'd feel better about you attributing it to the book. No, no, it is. That's what okay. it is. Okay. Thank you. Or, or as the author relates. Right. Okay. JD? Uh, yeah, Dale, Christine, I'm sure this is a, a, probably a good idea, but I have no way of judging. This is a citywide issue. Was there a, a presentation? to the transportation committee about this alternative. Uh, I, I wanna support this, but you, you're making a claim that this would be a better move and I, I'm sure you're right, but um, how did you arrive at this conclusion? Well, did the, we, didn't, we didn't have the a- committee have a discussion, have experts in or- We didn't have a presentation. The experts, are, the experts are in the room is that over the years, we have tried to work with NYPD on the traffic and we have worked with them in various capacities and, mm -hmm. and it has not been very successful. And, and, you know, our vision of where they are going versus where DOT is going, it doesn't seem to be aligned. And for the result in our neighborhood, I think it's really driven by what we would like to see in our neighborhood, but I can't, we can't make a recommendation just for our neighborhood, right? So uh, I, I think the recommendation is essentially to say, look, if you were aligning the traffic, which is an enforcement, the, the enforcement and align it with 
uh, what DOT is trying to do, which is to fix the streets and, and you know, calm the traffic, etc. I think that would work better than where we see here NYPD going mm -hmm. one direction and DOT going another direction. I understand that, Christine. I would just be a little easier for me if I knew both sides, if there was a, a, a debate about the issues. I, I want to support this, but both the options are what the drawbacks well, will be. I need more of them. I wish I had more to go on. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah, I just think that historically, these enforcement agents were at DOT, period. It's only a very recent event that they went to the police and they were effective because they were the, the guys in the, and the women in the brown uniforms and they just did their job, period. And that's how it worked. So to speak to JD's issue, this is a very recent thing and it was very much about consolidating all these functions into police. And I think we're going in the opposite direction anyway, but just functionally it worked for decades and decades in DOT. So th that's why I support it. Mm -hmm. just, Jessica? Sorry. Hang on, Jessica, did you have something? I, I just, I'm, I'm not familiar with, uh, and obviously New York is, is pretty sui generis, but I was just curious if there are other major cities or states where uh, DOT is part, oh, sorry, where traffic is part of DOT, and if that could be referenced, I think it might strengthen the argument. I'll, I'll look for it. I think they are, uh, and I so, um, I saw some articles, but I don't have that totally fresh in my mind, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look for it. I think, I think that's a good point. We can definitely point to other examples. I would just, I would just add, I'm sorry, just to count, just to well, we, we follow up on, yeah. I was just no, gonna go, add go ahead, Dale. We, go ahead, Dale. We've had, we've had, we've had interactions when it comes to crashes and collisions between vehicular and cyclists or vehicular and pedestrians where we have seen a repeated pattern of the CIS, like the local precincts, not being reluctant to involve the CIS, uh, the Collision Investigation Squad. We have seen that that squad itself is uh, woefully inadequate for the number of collisions that happen on a citywide basis. And very recently, uh, for whatever reason, the prior commissioner decided not to provide additional funding to that unit. So it seems like it's a demonstrable lack of interest in following up on investigations uh, in, in, with respect to collisions. For example, which we have seen in our committee over the many years and which has been playing out uh, at large. I have a question. I'm just wondering rank and file. The people who used to be the Brownies, the traffic department, they're now NYPD if we bring them back out of NYPD, what are we saying to those individuals? What kind of pushback are we gonna get from them? Is the PBA gonna get involved? I mean, I, I don't know whether or not we've thought about any of these things. Dale, if you've got an answer, go ahead. I do, um, they have a different union and um, the union has expressed some interest in remaining with the NYPD. I think they're largely interested in they're worried that like any such change would be an an institute uh, an opportunity to like uh, weaken their union or weaken their uh, salary and benefits. It's very interesting that the um, Traffic Enforcement Bureau is a highly diverse workforce. It is it is made up almost it is made up uh, it, it has high quantities of people of color and women, and that is in stark contrast to the NYPD at large. So in a way, the NYPD relies on the, the demographics of traffic enforcement to boost their diversity, when in fact they have resisted a lot of efforts at diversifying their force. And there are a lot of other, um, so I think the, the rank and file workforce would be, um, would probably be happy if the change meant better working conditions and better salary and benefits for them, not necessarily uh, opposed to it on ideological grounds. All right, but that's your, your guessing based upon what you've read, we don't know for sure. No, we don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm basing that on the fact that the statement came from the union rep and was 
largely concerned with the workforce's status in terms okay. of like the strength of their union protections. Thank you, Dale. Maria. Um, for Dale and Christine, I guess I was just curious where, I don't know how to frame the question, but like the idea behind writing the letter or what was the crux of it? And or, you know, to make you, to have this and write this letter and discuss this. Um, there is, there has been like among transportation advocates who have seen the repeated instances of um, interactions between police officers and cyclists, police officers and pedestrians. And also the issue I pointed out to with CIS, there, ha there are transportation advocates and, and experts who have pointed to this as a possible uh, solution. There's a, uh, a recent report from Transportation Alternatives that outlines this as a possible course of action. To but it's not, it's not just that, because we had decided to write that letter a little before that. It's, it's that there is a, a general discussion right now about how to organize NYPD. And, okay. and, and you know, it's a, a lot of people, as, as uh, uh, Dale says, are suggesting that they are they should break down you know the uh, uh, school and then the DOT and and, and then the transport etc and we, we just wanted to add our uh, voice to the fact that we think that separating the, the the transportation bureau could be a very good idea I mean there, there could be a lot of things a lot of benefits for that it's what true. The, the transportation alternatives report came out after we had this discussion yeah. so what was the voted committee on the same page yeah dale, dale what was the voted committee voted committee was all but one approved okay. i don't think that there were any present not eligibles so how many are we on the committee now we have a big committee at this point you have like 17 okay that's so it, it, 16 all, it was all but one. okay alan so if this goes through and there's an accident you call 911 who responds well, they'll figure it out. I mean, you know, nine one one is uh, anyway. Uh, it's the uh, it, 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 if you call nine one one and it's a transportation, it's probably a, an ambulance, and and they will have to figure it out. I mean, they they, they route this nine one one call to FI, to police, to different places. So that's not uh, different. Essentially, they will have to decide which group is responding to those calls. Okay. Seeing no, no other question, hang on, yeah. seeing no other questions here. And there is a question from the, pa from the panelists. Jesse, can you unmute Elka? Ms. Fears, go ahead. Hi, I just, um, regarding this, I mean, I remember when they turn, when the brownies, et cetera, were made part of the police department. Um, from the Brownie side, I think to them, it made them feel more important because everyone just Brownies. So that was one thing. I, I, my feeling is you should bring the police into this discussion. I suspect most of them will say, yeah, give them back to DOT. But I, I think you should give them the courtesy of hearing what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the from the attendees? Can I can I just ask a clarifying question on that? Sure, Dale. Okay. Um, just to understand your question, did you mean to bring the tra tra the people the um the traffic the enforcement agents or the or the or the um the head of the NYP the, the, the NYP the NYPD since you're asking them to relieve themselves of that department. So I would, I would think to get their feelings on this. Sure, I mean, that makes sense to me, but wouldn't you also want to include traffic enforcement like their leadership? Sure, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just have a, a point about that. I don't know that we Go are, ahead, Christine. I don't know that we are in a position to, first of all, I don't think that NYPD would comment on anything like that. This is a, de Blasio decision. So it's, you know, I don't know that we could get any uh, information from them. Okay, anyone else? Kit, I, yeah, Kit, go ahead. 
Yeah, just a suggestion um, coming out of Lowell's question and, and hearing some of the things you said, Dale, I wonder if we might want to include language around um, when this shift happens, um, the folks who um, are impacted by it uh, should, I don't know exactly how you would word it, but be able to maintain the salary and benefits um, that they have been on track for. That could potentially get ahead of some of the um, possible union concerns, but then also just knowing that this group of folks is uh, slanted much more towards women and much more towards people of color than the NYPD at large. Um, I think it would behoove us to be clear that, you know, we don't want um, a group of more female, more black and brown uh, folks to be paid less, to potentially have worse benefits, potentially, if this shift happens, because they lose some of the union negotiating power that they might have had. A good idea. I, I agree with that suggestion. I'm, am I on mute? Am I talking? Yeah. You're talking. I, agree with, I agree with that suggestion, Kit, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and write up language where you know, to the effect of we, um, you know, work with the union representing them and name the union and also, um, you know, recognize that we value the service that these men and women provide and, you know, do not want to see this as an opportunity to, you know, uh, diminish their, uh, their salaries and or benefits. I agree. Because that has happened in other instances, like I think in Camden, for instance, people were, it was basically a union busting, like a lot of people are pointing to Camden as a model for, um, def, you know, like successful defunding. But I think as it was prosecuted under Governor Christie, it was essentially a union busting operation. And that's not what we're interested in, in replicating. Mike Noble. Yeah, I wonder, are school crossing guards contemplated by this as well? No. Uh, no, I don't think yeah. so. Oh, no, no, school. Completely different. Right. Yeah, it's, it's mainly the, the traffic enforcement agents. That's the body of the, of the workforce. And then the engineers that are in uh, the traffic enforcement office and or the traffic. Um, the yeah, and then, um, then a, a couple of small agencies you know, specialized agencies within, in, within NYPD. Bert? Yeah, si since most of these people are not police officers, right? Am I? That's right. correct. So they don't get the police officer salary schedule. They no, have, they have a much different- uh, They have their own salary schedule. Okay, so why, what's the threat of it being diminished if, they're in DOT, right? Well, I think any, but, you know, people are always afraid of change. And there have been, you know, like I said, there have been instances before where in the name of reform, yeah, people yeah. have done union busting. So I don't think there's, you know, there's a, a, I'm not saying it's not legitimate. I'm just saying it's not, it's not a foregone conclusion that changing the operation, switching the operation from NYPD purview to DOT purview will be bad for the employees. It could potentially be better for the employees. But we haven't heard from the employees themselves to know right. that. Yeah. Okay, Joe, and then I'm cutting this off. I'm moving to adopt the uh, letter as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. I'm a no. I'm the only no. Okay. Anyone abstaining? Present not eligible. All right, that letter passes. Christine, we're back to you. Do you want me to okay. take this one, Christine? Yeah, if you want to describe what it is. Okay. Um, so we have seen, um, you know, so Community Board 4 has three police precincts within its boundaries and one out of its boundaries that's not coterminous, that handles a small section of it. And all four of these precincts, in response to some of the looting that happened in June 1st and 2nd, as they've indicated, uh, have barricaded the streets that the precincts are on. Um, so that goes for Midtown North, that goes for Midtown South, that goes for the 10th precinct, and that goes for the 13th precinct. 
Um, it seems it's also citywide, like a lot of precincts, not all precincts, but a lot of precincts have opted to barricade. Um, uh, when asked about this, they said, you know, well, did you see the looting? Did you see the rioting? Um, but, you know, we looked into this and it seems that while precincts are permitted to do such a thing for a period of 48 hours by, um, according to the city charter, by the administrative code, if they do, if they barricade for more than 48 hours, they're obligated to, to, uh, to notify city council members and also the community boards. And as far as we know, we have no notice whatsoever from any of the precincts. Um, so we are asking them to stop barricading the streets. We've had reports. We had a report from a, from a, a, a board member that tried to report a crime in progress to the Midtown North Precinct that he was not permitted to access the precinct in order to report that crime. We've had reports from board members who live on blocks with police precincts that they're asked questions coming and going from home. Like, what, is, what are you doing on this block? Why, are you, why do you need to cross this barrier? And this is, a, this, is a, a resident, this is a person of color and a resident of the very block that is being barricaded. So it seems really unacceptable that they're barricading the streets. It seems really um, contrary to the, the reasoning that they're giving that there's rioting going on. It doesn't seem like the rioting is happening on streets with police precincts or the looting that they referred to on Fifth Avenue. And it seems like not a very good way to like bring the community in, in this moment that we're facing. Um, so for those reasons, we're asking that the precincts bring down the barricades immediately and give us the re give us who and what was responsible for the decision in the first place and the lack of notification. Okay, long list of questions. Mike Noble first. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to interject something here because it's a topic. You know, last night, you know, we've had some people firing uh, fireworks here. Big yeah. time. War zone type stuff. Yeah. So in a recent Zoom meeting, the new community affairs uh, officer, uh, Officer Clark, made her uh, info, uh, you know, her contact uh, stuff available. And we should call her, she said, uh, if we can't get through on 911 or 311, you know, stuff like this. So I did last night. I called the fireworks were going off and I got a voicemail <clears throat> today. She called me back at noon. Right. And I talked to her for a long time. I didn't tell her I was a member of the board at that point. Okay. We just talked about a lot of things and she's super engaged. She replaces Mike Petrillo who got uh, elevated, got you know promotion and she's very much involved. You know, and the fact that she called me is just blew my mind. I didn't even leave my name. I just told her in general, of why I was uh -huh. anyway so at the end of the conversation i said by the way i happen to be a member of this board and i would mention her uh, tonight at this meeting she said oh great well tell them whenever you want me to appear at a meeting you know just email me and she gave me her email address and all and i said yeah i would bring it up and let everybody know so i think uh whenever some comes up that she'd be interested in we should we should do that you know she's really super good you know she just that's great breath of, a breath of fresh air i must tell you because mike petrillo was actually getting burnt out <laughs> i love the guy he became a friend but he's a bit burnt out i must tell you and she's I, great mike can I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in here for a second i want to add this that there are we had a call, it was me and Jesse and representatives, Alan was on uh, some of the block associations with Deputy Inspector Coleman, who's the commanding officer of the 10th, and Officer Clark was on, and we raised some of these same issues with them. So they were aware of it. It's not surprising me, to me, Mike, that Officer Clark was willing to talk to you. She seems willing to talk to anyone, anytime, um, which is how we got the meeting with Inspector Coleman. Yeah, but let me tell you about the fireworks. So I call 311, they refer me to 911. Call 911, refer me back to 311. And that's why <laughs> I called her. So Eric Adams over in Brooklyn this morning says, please don't call these numbers. Go down and talk to these folks yourself. And I said, what? 
I'm going to go talk to one of these guys who probably has a gun as well. And <laughs> Officer Clark, she agreed with me. Don't do that. Do not confront these people. You know, you know, get through to her if I can't get through. So she's going to send people around every night, she told me, you know, from now on to see that these people aren't out here. And last night, a guy with a, right in my building, a guy with a, a pistol in his waistband was recorded at 2 a.m. this morning walking around the neighborhood. So it's that sort of thing. The fireworks and the guns seem to go hand in hand throughout the city, not just here. Yeah. Can I just ask, Mike, where are you exactly that you're experiencing? Uh, the 10th Avenue between 25th and 26th, but the fireworks okay. are being shot off on 25th Street between 9th and 10th. And I'm okay. talking about war zone quality. Oh yeah, I've uh, seen. No, no, I've, really. seen all the, I've seen the reports. And then when you mentioned the woman, uh, she was from the 10th precinct. She's the yeah. community affairs officer at the 10th. Okay, great. I mean, it's, I'm really glad to hear that there's somebody there who's responsive. Oh, yeah. so. No, but again, that's one of that's one of four precincts in our district, or that yeah. ever our district. All she right, I was going to go to. She made my day. All right, I was going to go to Bert next, but he appears to be missing in action. I'll go to Joe. No, not you're Joe. not Joe. Joe had his hand Bert raised. Uh, all right. All I right. I my hand raised. I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. You do or you don't, Bert? I don't. All right. Well, I, then your hands are raised from the last time around. JD. Uh, yeah, I want to address this because this letter has really upset uh, a large number of people in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood who have been working for decades to improve relations with Midtown North and the community. Uh, I point out, first of all, 54th Street, where Midtown North is located, is right next to the courthouse, the community courthouse. Uh, Dolores, who lives uh, above the precinct on 8th Avenue, had reported that fireworks were being directed towards the precinct. I believe that many, as you say, Dale, many precincts were closed. Uh, the streets were closed for whatever reason. Dolores, just the other day, came uh, from 9th Avenue and wanted to cross 54th, and the police officer said, sure, fine, go ahead. Secondly, we've had two Zoom meetings now, uh, the most recent one last Tuesday, with Midtown North Precinct Community Council, with about 40 community members talking about all the issues, the concerns. There was uh, a general praise for the restraint that the police were showing. Uh, Eric Botcher was there and praised the, uh, the precinct for doing a good job. I just find if there was a problem, somebody couldn't report a robbery, that is a terrible thing. And Jesse should try to reach out to Midtown North and say, hey, what, what happened here? Uh, but to write this letter and to tack on at the end that the police have become the enemy of the people, that does not represent what a large number of us think up here. In one precinct. It, it I'm not finished, Dale. It diminishes, diminishes all we're trying to do. And if the Transportation Committee uh, has such an issue with that, then I'm going to ask the chair to allow us to sit down and frankly talk about this. Because your perception, I'm sure it's fine, but it is not our perception. And so let's work together. But this letter either needs to be withdrawn or toned down are directed towards Midtown South or the 13th, uh, if you feel it should be. We've had numerous, uh, uh, at least three or four uh, board chairs who have worked with Midtown North, any number of board members who still try to work with Midtown North. The Zoom meetings were run by a black woman. What? We're trying to do what we can. And this just undercuts us. And I think there's much better ways to deal with this situation, and you're right to point it out, but I think there's more effective ways to deal with it than to write this, this strident letter. All right. Are you done? Are you uh, I, I, now, this is my meeting, Dale, not yours. Um, I think that's Dolores on the phone. Is that you, Dolores? With, yes. With apologies, I have a very bad connection, so I may cut in and out. Um, bottom line, is I'm very disappointed that we 
you would think that this is an appropriate letter. Since September 11th, any threat to NYPD has caused precincts to be closed. I live across from a police precinct. This is standard, and this is not an issue. If you have to get down the block and you live on the block, yes, you're asked questions. In terms of the fireworks, fireworks are being directed to agitate the police. Almost nightly fireworks are being shot over Midtown North, which I can see from my apartment coming from the 53rd Street side over 54th. This is to elicit an action, reaction from the police, and this is also to uh, scare uh, residents into thinking that there is something going on. The fact that the block is closed is for the protection of not only the police, but for the people in the area. We still, regardless of coronavirus, are our number one terrorist target around, for around the globe. The fact that the blocks are closed off is to ensure that people know who's coming in, who's going out, what their purpose there is, and it's for our safety. I find it, as I mentioned, very disappointing that we would go ahead and think that this is an infringement on our rights and that this is an issue that the board, speaking for the district, has. I question that. And I agree that we think about withdrawing this letter entirely and appropriately speaking with all of these precincts as Jesse does on a regular basis at the district, uh, the district cabinet meetings and figure out how to be a better partner with the people who do protect and serve. All right, I'm gonna jump in just to comment on what you said, Dolores. Um, at our meeting with the 10th, it was the strong opinion of the block associations in the West 20s, which was the subject of all of that looting, that it was sending a bad message from the NYPD to be closing off that street in the aftermath of the local population feeling not protected by the NYPD. I'm not asking, I'm, I'm not asking for a response, I'm just relaying what was said at that meeting. Jeffrey, you're next. Thank you, Lowell. Um, this letter came out as a matter of process. Um, there are requirements laid out um, around the responsibilities of the NYPD through the charter and through the administrative code, the rules of the city of New York. Um, they were not followed. They were seemingly completely ignored. And, you know, at the same meeting at transportation, I think it was about two weeks ago, the committee, as, um, you know, reactively, we reacted to the fact that in the same meeting, we took up the topic of the 14th Street busway. And we reacted to the fact that there was a developed and well-defined community process that was completely ignored by the mayor. And so the committee then went ahead and, and, and called that out, that there were prescribed things that were supposed to happen that didn't happen. The charter defines what's supposed to happen. If the police close any block, not just a precinct block, any block for more than 48 hours, they have to tell the DOT commissioner. If it goes on for longer than five days, they are required to tell the, the community board and the council member, that's all. So, that this is seen as an attack on the NYPD, it's an attack on process and their flagrant disregard for the process that exists to make sure that we as New Yorkers have agencies that are transparent. All right, Kit. Um, I think I agree with the passion on both sides of this one. Um, and the spirit of, uh, or the content of what the letter says that the NYPD should follow the process to Jeffrey's point. Um, and if that was the way that we said it in a non, um, in a way that I think overgeneralizes um, the NYPD, I think this could be a strong letter. Um, but I think we do need to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, to Dolores's point, these are folks who protect and serve. Um, just from reading the news, I know there's been at least two attempted Molotov cocktail attacks on the NYPD. And so as a person of color, um, I'm as concerned as anyone about police brutality and about systemic racism. But when I read this letter, um, I was concerned with the tone of it. And I hope that maybe we can say 
you know, to Jeffrey's point, to what I think the point of the letter was, the NYPD shouldn't shut down streets without following the process for doing so, without saying in a way that uh, I think puts us at odds with the NYPD as a board and as a district. All right, Maria. Um, thank you, Lowell. Um, I just had two questions. Uh, have there, I don't know who can answer this, I guess you, Lowell, has there been any meetings with the community board related to this, about this topic with anyone? The only meeting that we've had is with the 10th. It was partly asked for by the block associations and we put ourselves in the middle of it. And this issue was raised. Um, Inspector Coleman was, you know, very open-minded in hearing these complaints and he understood what the local residents were saying about 20th Street being barricaded. He also indicated that it is not a precinct level issue, that the instructions to close off the streets came from Police Plaza. Oh, I see. Um, and did they discuss at all? Did it come up when an end date is supposed to be for this? No. The closures? As um, of Right now, the, many of the streets are still closed, but at least one was opened. Uh, for the Mid Midtown South opened one of their streets, I believe. But 54th is still closed. Um, I, I hear what Dolores is saying, and I hear what Jeffrey's saying, so I am just... Um, I... One of the things that I would just ask if it could the language could be changed somehow with that part about the enemy uh that sentence with the enemy i don't know what could be there in its place but maybe changing it a little bit um and, i mean i'm i'm not opposed yeah. to i'm not opposed to making the language more neutral i will just say that had the nypd followed the process there wouldn't be open speculation about their motives in closing the streets so they should have followed the process. The process is very clearly outlined. And you, you can say, I mean, I, I hear the defenders of Midtown North, that's only one precinct out of four, saying that they enjoy great relationships. Congratulations, that's fantastic. But I don't hear anybody saying, making, giving a reason as to why the process was not followed. No, and when we asked, when we asked the, the commanding officer of the 10th, he could not answer it either. He referred us to Police Plaza. Mike, you spoke already. I want to try and get everyone who hasn't spoken first. I'm going to... A final comment, though. No, no, no Mike, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to let everyone else speak <laughs> oh, oh, good, 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 first. Good, good. Betty, right. Betty, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just had a, th a thought um, that perhaps a letter that's an administrative letter that's much more neutral about just the process and, and outlining the process and also saying it would be very helpful to know the reason why they do the bar barricades. And I just think it could be very simple and without a lot of um, emotion. So that's my thoughts. Frank? Uh, I guess I, I agree strongly with what Betty and Maria has been saying here. Um, I think as drafted, it is very much a letter about the police and not about enforcing regulations. And whatever our individual personal feelings about where on that issue right now, I'm concerned about, I guess there are tw 12 or 13 members of the board on this call making a decision to send the, the letter in this form out uh, on behalf of the entire board, because I think it's a type of issue that everyone on the board is likely to have varying opinions about. Um, I also had a question. There's a line in the letter that says, the barricading has resulted in district residents being unable to access basic police services. Is that a reference to that one person who couldn't make a report or is there broader support for that statement? I mean, I think a, a, it is a reference to one of, of one of our fellow board members who reported this happening, and it happened repeatedly because he was he, it, the apparently the, there was a burglary in process that he seeked to report. Uh, the person was eventually picked up and then released, and then he came back and tried to burgle the same 
apartment building again. And the person that I'm referring to went back to the police precinct again and was impeded from reporting. So it's one person, but it's repeatedly. Okay, thanks. All right, Alan. Well, I think everybody's points are well taken. I think that um, uh, NYPD needs to follow the charter, whatever, whatever the rules and regulations are, as they uh, would like uh, the citizens to follow. And they need to do that also, but I think the tone needs to be changed. But I think this also is a good opportunity for uh, uh, the plaza, uh, the, the, the guys on top, to try to establish a better communication through the precinct to the community. This, is, this, should have cut, this should have come out from the precinct or maybe from police plaza, that this is going to happen. Uh, we're going to communicate this to the, uh, uh, the public as to why we're doing this. Um, however, it should have come out and possibly, probably should have come out through the precinct, which has a better um, inroad into the communities. So it, it's an opportunity for them to get educated in a way and how to go forward next time when something like this happens. So I think that should be part of the letter also. All right, Mike, now I'm coming back to you. Uh, yeah, I had sent uh, Christine and Dale some uh, suggested changes here, which Christine, I guess, accepted. Uh, I was trying to highlight the process, right? So I made the whole process section, the separate paragraph, paragraph two. My further suggestion would be to get rid of the last paragraph of the letter, all right? That would seem to cure a lot of these problems. Just get rid of that last paragraph and leave everything the way it is, as I suggested to Christine. All right. Um, I'm, hang on. I want to get I want to get the public, and then I'm going to come back to Dale and Christine, as the as the co-chairs. Elka, you have your hand okay. raised. Here I am again. Okay. Thank you for listening. Um, I think you'll all agree. These are very emotional times. They're trying times. They're history-making times. Um, I certainly support all that Dolores and JD have said, because, I mean, I've been going to police precinct community councils since the 80s when we had drug and prostitution problems here. So my solution was to get to know the police, which I highly recommend to everyone. So my question is, was anyone um, having these concerns when the box were closed down for 9-11? Did anyone say, wait, you're not following the charter. It's 48 hours and you're still blocked. Just a question. Um, I, wasn't on the, I wasn't on the board in 2001. I'm just, it's, a, it's a rhetorical, rhetorical question. question. Rhetorical question. Um, the other, if such a letter, again, I don't want to repeat everything Dolores and JD said. We have, a, we have I mean, having worked with the police at Midtown North, and we have some great people, the last precinct meeting, our inspector Ioko again said how bottles are thrown at them, rocks are thrown at them. One of the reasons that they need to keep the block, the uh, barriers up. So um, again, time. What I would recommend for this letter is that it say, can you give us an indication of when these barricades, when you think it might be safe to remove the barricades on the precinct blocks? And certainly the enemy of the people is something that sounds like Trump. And if you're a Trump supporter, I'm sorry, but I mean, it's ridiculous. So, sorry, I get emotional because this is such a, such a very emotional time for everybody. And um, thank you for listening. Larry Roberts. Jesse, can you promote him? Doing so. All right, you should be able to unmute. Yep, there you go. Um, first of all, I think uh, this may possibly be a moot subject. Um, I spoke to Detective Dugan this morning, and he um, he thought that this was something that was going to um, be disappearing in the next few days. I don't know that officially, That's but um, this, as Elka stated previously, is is something that was fairly unprecedented 
in terms of the looting and the rioting situation just at our meeting last Tuesday night. Right before that, outside my window, I could hear a big mob going up Ninth Avenue toward the precinct, and this was right before our meeting started. And Inspector Ioko said that there were, had been bottles thrown, rocks thrown, and I think they were just trying to defuse a situation from happening where these people were coming right next to the precinct. So again, I, I, I think the suggestions of Dolores, JD, and others is, 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 are great. And uh, I think that um, the letter probably shouldn't even be sent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm gonna ask Dale and Christine before comments, I wanna propose something to you. Would the two of you be willing to withdraw this letter and have it replaced with an administrative letter that calls out the charter violations and asks when we can expect to have these removed? Or do you wanna to stick to your letter? No, I, was, I was going to propose something else. I was going to propose that we take in account all the suggestions which have been made, which is to very focus exclusively on process remove all the uh, you know other statements at the end and um, and and, st and st take what alan was saying which is elevate you know a, a suggestion that there would be a process and then there should be a process there should be better communication and when are they going to possibly remove them i think and, we're saying the same thing christine no no i'd, I'd like to put it as a letter, not as an admin letter. That's fine, but I think we're the content, I think we're looking at the same thing. Dale, you wanna weigh in here? Yeah, um, I just wanna make a, a little, give a little process background. We had actually drafted a much more neutral letter and got a lot of feedback from the members of our committee that the, um, that the you know, that the, the sentiment that is being felt in a lot of places on, in the district should be incorporated. So again, to those of you who have great relationships with Midtown North, I think that's fantastic. And I think it's a good example for, the, for many of us. However, that is not district-wide. That is one precinct out of four that serves us. And also on the first um, item of tonight's meeting, JD made a case for how important notification was in our city processes. So I'm just making the same case here. So, you know, absent the, the uh, you know, the, the emotional language, I don't think the process can be, the admit the process cases should be so controversial. And um, um, yeah, so that's where, that's where we're at on this. Okay. Um... Are you willing to withdraw the letter as written in favor of the letter Christine is proposing, Dale? Yes. Okay, then I will entertain a motion on Christine's revised letter. Hang, Hang on, one, Jesse. Sorry, one thing. Can we, uh, and this actually goes for the other transportation letter. Is there, or is there a reason why we're sending it just to Corey? Just because I find both of these to be sort of I think Corey plays a no, role. No, you're right. If we, I, I think that should go to. Uh, it should go to De Blasio and the police commissioner. De Blasio and one police plaza. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. I, just just, to I think it was you. just left off the draft. The other one okay. was going to Corey because these are the discussion between the city council and uh, for the budget. And you possibly, to, yeah, sorry. and possibly to Polly Trottenberg also to right. DOT. Yeah. That's fine, okay. but you know if we send it also to the mayor's side of stuff. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. okay. Now I will entertain a motion for Christine's letter as revised, a more neutral letter asking when they'll be done um, and when the streets will be reopened without getting into the histrionics. Somebody want to make that motion? Oh, so moved supporting this letter. We just amend based on all the comments we've heard. All right. Is there a second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Any opposed? Bird opposed. Is, Bird is opposed. Dolores is opposed. Frank is opposed. All right. Anyone abstaining? Present not eligible. JD, were you in favor? I didn't get your vote. I'm sorry. You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I would be in favor of an amended, toned down, administrative. That's what letter. we're voting. That's what we're voting on. Okay. I just didn't hear you. All right. 
Jesse, what are you saying? You're not saying anything because you're on mute. <laughs> it's only the fifth time I've did that today. I'm just to be clear. Just to be clear. We're voting on a letter, so therefore it's not administrative. So it, it's, it's not administrative. But it is the what we. It is the con. It is the contents of what I proposed as an administrative letter that Christine then proposed as a full transportation letter. So this is going as a full transportation letter, but way down in terms of tone. Opposed. I'm opposed. There are, all right, so that's what I'm checking. So there are four opposed. Everyone else was in favor. Anyone else abstaining, present, not eligible. Okay, so the letter passes as amended. All right, next, we've still got one more letter and then we've got outdoor dining to talk about. Jeffrey, WPE letter. Very straightforward. We felt this should come out of exec because of the extreme use happening at the parks across the city. The, park, the track at Chelsea Park is completely falling apart and we really wanted to draw attention to that. There's cones all over the place. Um, it's both dangerous, still heavily used. Um, so just hoping, wanting to get that out to parks ASAP. Any questions? Patty. You caught yourself, Betty, nicely done. <laughs> I, I was at that meeting and I thought that, I don't know who took all the lovely photos that were there. Did you take those photos? That anyway. was Brett. Oh, Brett. Anyway, I think they were very effective and I suggest that a couple of those photos be added to the letter. Jesse, we can ask Brett for those photos, right? Yeah, that's great, Betty, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Somebody want to make a motion? Make a motion. Second. All those in favor of the letter? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Anyone present not eligible or abstaining? All right, that goes. The city's outdoor temporary dining program. Buckle up your seatbelts, folks. We're going to be here a while. Frank, do you want to kick us off and tell us what we think we know so far? <sighs> Sure, with an emphasis on the think. Um, a bunch of us have been working since Thursday, I guess, to try to figure out exactly what the lay of the land is in terms of uh, what uh, bars and restaurants have to do uh, with various state and city agencies uh, to proceed with outdoor dining. Uh, we believe what the lay of the land is, is as the following, that there is a divide between whether the uh, establishment wants to use the sidewalk and the street versus using a rear yard or a roof or some kind of uh, private property. Uh, if the restaurant wants to use the sidewalk or the street, the uh, approval procedure is relatively straightforward and very limited. They simply have to file uh, a very short application with the Department of Transportation, sort of saying what the, that they want to do this, what the layout's going to be like, and certifying that they understand all the rules. If they do that, there's no notice to the community board. They don't have to go to the SLA to expand their liquor license. Uh, their filing with the DOT counts for uh, their SLA filing. They can just go ahead and do it. And as far as we can tell, uh, the only way we're going to find out about it is when the DOT comes up with this interactive map, they say is forthcoming, showing everyone uh, who has applied for this street and sidewalk usage. Uh, we've raised various questions about enforcement and have not gotten very good answers. Uh, with respect to rear yards, uh, roofs, uh, parking lots next door, uh, it appears that the city has no role in that process. Uh, so therefore, it looks like the entire process will depend on the SLA, uh, which will also give the community board uh, a little more input into the process. Uh, we believe what the SLA is saying is that if the community board has existing restrictions with an applicant on the use of a rear yard, for example, saying they won't use it at all, They'll only use it until nine o'clock, et cetera. Uh, the SLA will enforce those restrictions unless the applicant gets a letter from the community board 
saying we are relaxing those restrictions and allowing broader use. Uh, can you talk also about the uh, the governor uh, guideline on uh, the twelve, the, the six feet enforcement around everything? Yeah, you mean the standing around the hundred feet? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's a separate issue, but just so everyone is up to speed, um, th th there's been a lot of bad press about large groups of people uh, congregating and drinking outside establishments, on street corners, uh, all throughout the city. Uh, it's become particularly bad on Hell's Kitchen. In fact, I went to a mini press conference that Gail and Brad Hoyleman had Saturday night at eight o'clock on one of the worst corners here at 51st and 9th. Um, the excuse uh, everyone has been hearing from operators uh, is that they can't do anything once they sell a to-go beverage. Uh, then it's really up to, uh, you know, the individuals to behave themselves and the police to enforce it. What the governor did uh, on Friday, I believe, and the SLA commissioner issued a very strong letter of support saying that licensed establishments have to patrol within 100 feet around uh, the front of their building and ensure that all laws and guidelines are being uh, complied with, which includes social distancing, mask wearing, and the open container law, which prohibits uh, people from eating, uh, from drinking alcoholic beverages on the city sidewalks and streets. Okay. I, I have one more thing, uh, Lowell. Go ahead, Christine. Okay. So um, the, the problem now, which has developed with the guideline which was published by DOT in order to do, uh, maybe Jesse, you could put up the guideline, the, Q, the, Q and, the FAQs or Q&A or whatever, at page two. Give me one second. So I can explain what the problem is. Okay, so go to page three, if you can. Yeah, so for everyone, uh, the guideline is that as in sidewalk cafe, the distance from the outdoor seating and uh, the sidewalk, I mean the, the curb is eight feet. So if you want to respect and they have all, all kinds of guidelines so that the tables are away, you know, away from each other by six, by six feet. But now if you want as a pedestrian to be away from the dining crowd, you're going to be walking on two feet because you have to respect six feet to be away from the diners, right? And so you are only on two feet and you know what happened on those two feet. There are trees, etc. And if, if the open restaurant on the roadway seating, not on the bike lane, but along the, along the sidewalk is here, then you can literally not walk on the sidewalk because you, you will be four feet away from the, side, the, the, the cafe and four feet away from the, uh, from the seating. If you can imagine this box being along, forget about the bike lane. So the way it was being designed is that, you know, the pedestrian essentially cannot, uh, cannot walk on the, on the sidewalk. And so it just doesn't work. So I, I think that uh, we, we need to insist that on Ninth Avenue, they create a separate lane just for the pedestrians for people to go up and down the avenue. Because it's just 
technically, physically, doesn't work. Plus, indeed, I have seen a video today of all the examples of uh, sidewalk seating which have been put in the city, in Williamsburg, in everywhere. And, you know, the sidewalk is completely occupied by the city. Completely. End to end. So, uh, you know, it, the bottom line is that we are throwing the old lady under the bus. That would be me. Okay, who's next? Bert. I just want to emphasize, if it's not clear to people, that when an establishment puts in their application, it's self-certified. Yeah. There's no verification. No one from DOT goes out and says, oh, is it true what you put down? No, it's self-certified. The point is, they want to do this as fast as possible. They want it to happen, and it's going to happen. It is happening. They haven't thought it out through. Christine, you're always great in measuring <laughs> and working it out. It's wonderful. We could ask for it. Give us a lane on Ninth Avenue, right? There's not going to be that much traffic going into the tunnel because there's not that many cars coming in, at least initially. Okay, give us a link, we could ask it. But the point is, it's gonna happen. And it's, it's no one is out there, yeah. no one will be out there monitoring. The governor says that the owners should monitor. Yeah, and they'll all just shake their head. Oh, this crowd outside? I didn't, I didn't sell them anything. It's the guy down the block who sold them. So I, I have no control over these people. It's going to be a mess. And that's what's going to happen. All right. Let me, let me put some context around this. I want to say, and end it, law that yeah. we have very little control over this. Yeah. Well, let, that's where I'm going to jump in here. All right. The, at the time the mayor was announcing this, um, I was at borough board last Thursday. And there were reps from DOT who were explaining the plan as it existed last Thursday. And when questioned by me and the chair of CB2 and the chair of CB7 and a couple other chairs, they made it clear they had absolutely no answers to all of the questions we were asking. Simple stuff like what happens to a bike lane? So there was another meeting on Friday that I was not able to attend but what they have agreed to do is to bring in the powers that be to the borough service cabinet meeting with the district managers on Friday. And they invited all of the board chairs to attend this as well. So Jesse and I will both be there. What I would love to do is develop from this group a list of questions that we need answered. And so we can prevent, present those next Friday this coming Friday and say, these are the things that have come up. This is what we need to know. So now that you've heard basically what's going on, if you haven't been paying attention, there's the background of what we need to do here in order to try and solve it. Because as Bert said, we probably have very little control right now, but this is the one lever we can push. Jeffrey. Um, thank you for that context. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, and I mean, community boards were involved. Bids also were not involved, and yet we were explicitly outlined as being partners to this. And I got tipped off from a text message 10 minutes before the press conference started on Thursday that this announcement was forthcoming. Um, I think it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be the messiest, loudest summer in the city of New York. I hope we learn something from it, and I hope the city actually changes for the better. And I hope that we can come from starting first by saying thank you, even though it's a disaster. The city actually released something that is going to provide a lot of ability for restaurants, but it's also at the same time taking away a lot of space from pedestrians, which is where I think Christine's position is key, is we need to ask for more space. Again, actually getting back to a, a traffic plan, a traffic mitigation plan. Um, the city is, was bumper to bumper today. On my way downtown, I had to be meatpacking this morning to watch it, everything get set up down here. Um, so I think that that's critical. It's, it's 
carving out more space and taking it off the roadway, which this administration refuses to do. But if we start from thank you, maybe. All right, Dale. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so I believe I saw an implementation of this very uh, diagram on Ninth Avenue today. I think it was like an Irish bar in the 40s that had like taped the sidewalk to a passable corridor and then like taken over a parking spot and like barricaded it and put a stuffed animal with a ch in a chair just to like demarcate it to traffic. I don't know what they were doing. But in any event, it was definitely not eight feet wide. So already, you can um, assume that the operator is going to take liberties, and um, and there was also a tree pit which prevented it from being any anywhere close to eight feet wide. And then the the bare fact is that the servers going back and forth from the seating area that's in the parking space to the restaurant or the facility, the bar restaurant have to cross. The pedestrian area constantly. It just doesn't seem like it's a practical solution at all. All right, Alan, last comment. Um, well, we'll leave the practicality out of it because obviously it's not. But in terms of residents knowing that the particular establishment has complied with whatever regulations they're supposed to comply with, um, should they be posting something like they do now that they've gotten a license, that they've gotten something? Uh, that would be my question to this meeting that you're having, is that there should be some sort of a posting on uh, uh, a public posting somewhere that we have complied uh, with, or, or the city has said they have complied with all the regulations uh, that necessary uh, for whatever it is. Uh, otherwise, you know, people just say, oh, they're doing it. But I'm being, you know, shifted over to the to the gutter to walk. But um, I guess so. They know that the city has approved whatever it is that that you know is happening on the street. Alan, the 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 application. I went to do the application. The application asks you to put the net, your name, your address, and the address of the establishment, and submit. That's it. It doesn't ask. It doesn't ask no, you a question. It doesn't ask you anything. So, so there is no real, you know, approval. Or okay. So this, this is this is what I'm going to do now. I would like mm -hmm. everyone to come up with whatever questions they have about this, and send them to me and Jesse. I want them by noon on Thursday. And I'll, um, Frank and Bert, I would like to meet with you and Jesse Thursday afternoon to go through all of those and see what makes sense and what we can do. Christine, you should join us too, since it's a DOT issue. And we'll go from there and then Bert and I, uh, Jesse and I will have questions to submit for Friday morning. Does that make sense to everyone? And yeah. Dale. Somebody nod your head. And yeah, Dale. Dale should be invited yes. too, right? Yeah. Yes, Dale should be invited too. Thanks, Dad. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Dale, I'm just not thinking. All right, so that's where we are on, on the outside dining program. Um, committee schedule for July, Jesse? I'm assuming everybody read it. <laughs> Free light, <laughs> except the BLP. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's anybody has any changes, any suggestions, questions? Just remember, we don't meet in typically meet in August, except for BLP. So, all right. Having no questions. Public member appointments. Just so you are all aware, all of the existing public members were reappointed: Pam Wolf, Bob Benfado, Brian Weber, Paul Ames, David Pincus, Sally Greenspan. Inga Evchenko was made a public member of BLP. And we have appointed a woman named Mercedes Vargas to be a second um, public member to the ACES committee. She is a woman of color. She is a p parent of public school um, students. She was re recommended to us by Josephine Ishman. And we think she's going to be more help to the ACES committee as the education focus ramps up even further. Um, We've had two working group meetings. The social justice working group met last week. It is being chaired by Viren 
and Katie. Um, very good discussion um, about race and in, in, in systemic racism. They are targeting to have a report to full board of suggestions and things we can do by our July full board meeting. Um, I don't want to get into too much of the nitty gritty about what they're working on at this point, but that's what that's where they are headed. The balanced business working group met before this meeting um, for a first meeting, also trying to come up with suggestions for um, how we can help small businesses in the neighborhood. Um, we may be getting forums out of both of the working groups to um, spread information far and wide. Um, they're also out of the social justice working group. The one hint I'll give you is we may add training for community board members about inherent and systemic racism that everyone would be expected to participate in. Um, small meeting report. I already told you we met with the 10th. Um, we've met with, a, we had a meeting with the developers on 49th Street a couple of times that Joe's letter earlier was about. Um, we've met with DHS a couple of times. Jesse, what am I missing? Um, we met with, we had a meeting with some of the bar owners at the corner of 51st and 9th um, with Corey's office. This was about two weeks ago to try and get them in line and none of that worked. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it. I mean, we are, we are, are, are we are continually talking to our new, new neighbors of the providers of the, um, providers of the shelters that are coming into our district. Um, so, uh, we'll be meeting with the ones on 36th Street and 37th Street early next week, hopefully, uh, maybe later this week, we have to figure out a time between that and then bar, bar owners. I think that's pretty much we got we got that um, that's where we've been we did meet um with dhs maria was there joe unfortunately could not be stay on the meeting tonight was there um we did meet with dhs as a follow-up to uh eventually a um a uh, families with children shelter permanent shelter being placed uh which is a at 41st control. street yeah 41st street and dyer so um, but that's not, that's still a, long, a bit of a ways off. Um, but that was the most recent significant development. And we're okay. meeting the Port Authority tomorrow. Um, our new website has launched. Yeah. Um, I've gotten good feedback on it. Um, Janine in particular gets a lot of the credit, right, Jesse? I would say the, the lion's share of the work was between Janine and Katya. Katya, on, I would say even more Katya, you know, the, as people who know this, who've done this type of work before, just transferring over, two de you know, close to two decades worth of uh, material and making sure it still all makes sense and it's in the right place. And, and, you know, always what they provide you coming out of the package with these things are very limited. And you have to push them to make, expand it into something that works for us. And so Janine and did a heavy lifting on that and Katya did the, 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 the really painful process of relinking and shifting over all of those uh, documents that we have that we can now easily obtain. So, you know, obviously take a look at it. Please let us know. There's always going to be kinks. There's always going to be a little, I always found my site here to do this and do that, but uh, we'll try to fix those. The nice, some of the nice stuff is the calendar page is a much bigger, cleaner page that you can get the agendas on. You can get the, you can get it straight to your i uh, Google Calendar, your i Calendar. Um, you know, uh, the resolutions and page I think is a really is a much more cleaner page. Um, but all of the land use stuff is still there. JD, don't worry about it. We have the report from 1973 up there. We have, you know, all of that stuff is still easily findable. All of the stuff from the West Chelsea dist. Uh, West Chelsea um, Special District is there. Highline stuff is all there. So we really, really made a point of trying to make sure that all of that great document stuff, all that great documentation is uh, was still transferred over. 
Yeah, the URL changed officially, but you can still access it by going to mcb4.nyc. You enter that into your browser, it'll take you there. Yes, Dale. I will say I found the, um, am I, yeah, I will, I found, I had to do a lot of uh, archival searching and I found it more navigable to like search documents in the current, yeah, it was better. Okay, any other questions about the website? The last thing is our office space. Um, Frank, you in particular will love this one. Evidently, it is taking the Corporation Council office three to four weeks to review a contract as to form. Um, I asked how I can get a job there and, you know, because I figure if they don't have to work hard, why should I? Um, Jesse, has Henry, have you spoken to Henry this week? I have not. Okay. He's on my list to speak to tomorrow. I was hoping okay. to hear back from uh, DCAS about they yeah. received the contract. Everything is done except dotting the I's and crossing the T's, but that seems to be taking forever thanks to the administration. Um, anyone else have any old business or new business they want to raise? Going once, going twice. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.